Okay, welcome to class. Uh, yesterday, we talked about K equilibrium. We are in unit seven on equilibrium, which is a derivative in terms of concept of uh, rate law or kinetics, unit five. Uh, but this time we're looking at reversible reactions that have a rate that goes forward uh, because it can go in the forward direction creating product or a rate that goes reverse uh, in the reverse direction that creates more reactant. An equilibrium is a status, it's an uh, it's a dynamic state where your rate of the forward equals the rate of reactant. And yesterday, or the, yesterday, we reviewed La Chatelier's principle, which tells us what happens when your equilibrium is disturbed, when your reaction that's reversible finds that they have an outside stressor, whether it be concentration, additional pressure, only if there's different mole values on each side, um, and temperature change. What happens? And we looked at that response really quickly. And then we looked at, okay, Right now, equilibrium just kind of feels like this abstract concept. Let's put it into a quantitative value because technically equilibrium is represented through the ratio of product concentration versus reactant concentration raised to the respective stoichiometric molar coefficients, okay? So then we looked at the K expression and we looked at how to manipulate KEQ. Again, that value having no units being just a number that represents the general ratio between product and reactant at equilibrium. We looked at how we might do a type of algebraic summation using KEQ values to create or predict a uh, KEQ value for a composite reaction, an overall net reaction. And that's kind of where we left off. And um, for the warm up question, uh, here we have at equilibrium, and the key word here being at equilibrium. If it's not at equilibrium, the ratio, stop talking, the ratio between product and reactant is known as Q. It's just a general state, like an, an instantaneous ratio between the product and reactant. Okay, that's Q. But here we have at equilibrium, so you know you're getting K. You have the following gas pressures. Now, gas pressure is indicative of concentration. So what you should have gotten is K, and sometimes we write KP to represent that we're finding the equilibrium constant via partial pressure. Uh, product versus reactant. So you should have gotten NH3 raised to its respective stoichiometric ratio divided by uh, the ratio of N2 concentration times H2 concentration all over, th uh, or sorry, not all over, but raised to the power of three. Okay, so we get the following that it is 0 0.003 all over N2, which was our partial pressure of N2, the specific amount of pressure contributed by the N2, uh, which you can find using molar fraction ratio. If you don't remember what that means, you should. And um, times 0 0.039 cubed. And what you should have gotten was, you should have gotten the following value being 1.61. And again, it is a no unit. Okay, so here we see that it's greater than one, K is greater than one. So at equilibrium, the equilibrium position, or if you want to use the analogy of a balance, the fulcrum is favored toward the side of the product. So at equilibrium, we have more product <coughs> present than we do reactant. Okay, so for the next one, I'm, uh, you're going to have to first, you were told that at equilibrium, you have this temperature, you have the total pressure and you have the partial pressure of one of them. Now, automatically, what you should notice in the reaction is we will not include the solid at all. So what we care about is the pressures of just H2 and H2O. Now, we have the total pressure. So what we need to figure out, and we're given the partial pressure of H2. So that means that the pressure of H2O is going to be equal to the total pressure minus the contribution of H2, which is equal to 0 0.016 minus 0 0.013 which gives us, okay, thank you, 0 0.003, okay? So now you plug in to your KP equation and it is partial pressure of H2O, okay? And this is another way it can be written because technically above, I should make that little note actually, technically above, it's not real concentration being represented here, it's really partial pressure of the molecules. So you might find that we might write this as partial pressure expression as seen below. Okay, so I'll write it in the partial pressure expression. So partial pressure H2O, there's raised to a coefficient of one, so we're not going to even write that, 
times the partial pressure of H2 raised to the coefficient of one again. So we won't write that. Okay. Um, and what we get then is zero point uh, zero zero three all over zero point zero one three. And you should get a value of um, 0 0.23, which means that the hydrogen gas reactant side, reverse reaction, reverse rate is more favored at equilibrium, okay? So that is what you should have gotten. As far as this concept of complete versus partial alleviation, the idea is that if you have multiple reactants or multiple products, involved in establishing equilibrium and you're changing maybe one concentration at a time we say that it has alleviated the stress through a partial involving process it only required you to address one part of the chemical species on one side of the equation versus a complete alleviation is like uh, the example above where you just have one product or one reactant so no matter what change you do everybody's involved in it that's all so for the first one um you would see that this would actually be a complete alleviation because your solids would cancel so it's like you have a one chemical species reactant one chemical species product reaction your next one would be um partial alleviation and this by the way is an example of our unique topic that charlie will be teaching you ksp where it's a dissociation based um, equilibrium constant where you don't even have a reactant as a ratio. So you have this two, you have this multiplied value for K um, that's no longer in a ratio, but we would say it was partial because you have two now things that could potentially impact. And my guess is only in the problems that they give you one changes at a time. So to alleviate the stress, you would address one of those chemical species, a partial addressment. Okay. Um, and then finally, the last one, is um uh it would be partial as ooh <laughs> it would be complete okay so uh for k values we will be focusing on the following there are several sub sections of k we have kc which is our con our normal k k determined via equilibrium concentration we have kp which is partial pressure for gas only gas involving reactions. And then we have our very special KSP, which is specific to dissociation reactions of ionic compounds, okay? Um, that will be Charlie's topic. So now I wanna get you guys set up on the three types of equilibrium problems that we can possibly have. And if you are someone that the rate at which I'm gonna write out the math is going to be overwhelming, may I make the suggestion that you just watch. You watch you listen and you notice that I actually, for each practice problem, I give you the outline of how to solve the problem, but I am going to have to whip through this. So I apologize ahead of time. Okay. Three variables to keep in mind when we're solving equilibrium problems. Okay. And these three variables will create three types of problems that you can have. Okay. So the first is we're going to be obviously using KEQ. We're also going to be looking at the concentrations at equilibrium. Uh, thank you guys so much. I deeply appreciate it. And then <laughs> we're going to be looking at initial concentrations. So uh, the symbol would be X at EQ and X initial, right? You could kind of look at it various ways. So um, concepts applied through problem solving in these is one, you're going to be using a ton of reaction stoichiometry. Like it's going to be in, in uh, crucial, okay? And then two, uh, you're going to be using your equilibrium expression or your equilibrium law, okay? That pr uh, product over reactant raised to the respective stoichiometric molar coefficients, okay? These are the kind of the three elements plus two concepts that we're going to be applying in these problems. Now, we're also going to be using this unique table known as an ICE table. An ICE table stands for initial change in equilibrium. Okay, initial change in equilibrium. 
So this table will look like this, where you have I, C, E. And for each respective species, you track what was the initial concentration? What was the change in concentration? What's the concentration now at equilibrium? Okay, for some reaction above. All right, you doing okay, Sam? Uh, not really. <laughs> you did not get any sleep? No. Okay, I'm sorry. So why don't you just watch? Just watch, take a break from taking the notes and just listen, okay? So uh, don't forget, of course, we're gonna be in units of molarity and I really do everyone who's exhausted. I'm sorry I have to hit you guys with this after the quiz. Just listen, watch. If you're busted writing, just listen and write down notes, questions on the side that you have, okay? So for this first type of problem, this is your first type of um, equilibrium problem where you're gonna determine the KEQ value from the initial concentrations and one given equilibrium concentration. So here's the big idea. If coefficients of balanced equations provide proper mole ratio, what we can do is we can, okay, know the change. We can know the change in concentration of your respective species. So for example, for this first problem, we have the following gases were placed in a four liter flask, eight moles of N2, 10 moles of H2, and after equilibrium was achieved, 1.20 molar, NH3 was found. So what you do is to set up your ice table, you set it up ICE, you put a column for each chemical species, okay? So you would have to write your equilibrium balance chemical equation first. So step one, write your equilibrium reaction balance. Step two, set up the ice table, okay? And then plug in the given information. So I am given that I have the following concentrations of, um, eight moles of N2 in four liters. So I have a two molar concentration of N2. 10 moles of H2 in four liters gives me a, gee willikers, 2.5, okay? Molarity of H2 concentration. So I would put in initially, I have two molar, of N2 and 2.5 molar of H2 gas. Now it could also be given in partial pressure. That is also a possibility, okay? Um, and then of course, initially before reaction occurs, I have no product, okay? So, and then I'm given one equilibrium value. After equilibrium was achieved, I have 1.2 molar, and I don't need to write that in because that's assuming molarity, NH3. So now what I need to say is I need to determine what are these values? But to do that, to set it up into my KEQ expression and solve, but to do that, I need to figure out the change. And this is where your stoichiometry comes into place. If I have an additional change from NH3, zero to 1.2, my change is 1.2. And I know that for every, okay, for every 1.2 NH3, I have the following relationship, 3H2 for every 1.2, um, or sorry, for every 2 NH3. And so that's going to give me a value of um, 1.8, 1, 1. okay, change in H2. This is my change. So what I would say is because it's a reactant, I'm consuming it. It's a negative 1.8 change in H2 concentration. And then for N2, I know that for every one molar of um, N2, I have two moles of NH3. Again, using my stoichiometry to predict the, predict the change. That would give me a value of 0 0.6 NH3, uh, sorry, N2. Okay, and then what I mean, and since it's a reactant, I know I'm going to lose that 0 0.6. So now I'm able to get my equilibrium values, 2 minus 0 0.6. So 2 minus 0 0.6 is 1.4. 2.5 minus 1.8 is 0 0.7. And now I have my equilibrium concentrations that I plug into KEQ expression for um, the concentration of NH3 raised to the second power. 
all right, all over the concentration of H2 raised to the third times the concentration of N2 raised to the one. And I plug in my actual values. So I have 1.2 squared divided by 1.4 times 0 0.7 cubed. Oh, sorry, one, yeah, there it is, times 0 0.7 cubed, okay? And I get, sorry, that looks really bad. Uh, I'll do 0 0.7 cubed so it matches the order that I put it in, times 1.4. And I get a value of, I believe, three, okay? Which tells me that the product is favored at equilibrium. The production of NH3 is favored at equilibrium. Stay with me, stay with me. Okay, so just, I just saw you zoning. So um, why don't you try this next problem on your own? It's repeating the process. Go ahead and try this out. All right, so for this problem, you were given the following, okay? You have the reaction and you're gonna set up an ice table. So um, I might just rewrite, honestly, the reaction so that it fits my ice table. So I have two NH3 goes to N2 and 3H2. And I set up my ice table. Okay, and boom, boom. Okay, so, and that's probably was way too big. Oh my goodness. Hold on. Okay, so I set up my ice table and I'm told ugh, in the beginning that I have uh, seven moles in a 5.5 liter flask. So seven moles divided by 0.5 liters. And I get a molarity concentration uh, equals the molarity of NH3, which should have given me the value of uh, 14. And then of course I have no product initially in the beginning. So then I'm told at equilibrium, I have 6.2 molar N2, okay? So I know that I have 6.2 molar N2. So now what I do is I say to myself, okay, so let's use my stoichiometry to make predictions. So I know that I gained 6.2 in the N2 category. That was my change. I know for every one N2, I have three H2 also produced. So what's 6.2 times three? That would be 18.6. And it's a positive gain because I'm making more product. And that also will equate to my equilibrium concentration of H2. Now, I know for every 0.6, or sorry, 6.2 N2s, I'm gonna have twice that consumed by NH3. So I'm gonna have a minus 12.4, okay? So what I get then for my equilibrium values is 1.6, 6.2 and 18.6, giving me now a KEQ expression of N2, times H supposed to add up to 14 moles because that's how much we started with. Uh well, it, it, no. It, it, it's like let's say I, I have one mole of H2O and I hydrolyze it into H2 and O2. I'll still have two moles. Or let's say like you have one mole of you still like you can get it's more still moles from the same yeah. mass. The moles don't have to equal before and after. Yeah, um, so then you plug in, so it's um, 6.2 times uh, one, oh, good God, 18.6 cubed all over NH3, and again, at equilibrium values, 1.6. And you should have gotten that you have a value for KEQ of 1.6 times 10 to the fourth which is a huge KEQ, which basically says that this reaction goes nearly to completion. Why is there an NH3 produced second That's totally, I think, what is supposed to happen. That makes so much more sense. Yes, I just miswrote it, but that value is true. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so we would say at equilibrium, Um, the reaction goes nearly to completion. It basically is done. Okay. Um, awesome. So 
Where did you go? Uh, he was not supposed to go. Try the next one. We don't have the next one. Here's the second type of problem. Um, this is when we determine equilibrium concentrations from K and initial concentration given. So what we're asking is what will the concentrations look like, okay, after the system responds to stress, okay? So here we're given uh, the other two variables. So in this problem, we have another gas one. We're given the KEQ and we're given the finals, okay? So I'm gonna set up my table, H2 plus F2 goes to 2HF, okay? And what we get is ice concentration, or sorry, ice table of the concentration values. And again, I make this way too big every single time. Oh man. Nora? Who said the um? <laughs> Good God. Why does it hate me? It knows I'm stressed. When I'm stressed. How, how do you, it's about how do you do that? You know what, Nora? <laughs> so I'm told that I have originally um, injected into one liter flask 1.2 moles of H2. So 1.2 moles of H2 and 1.2 moles of F2. Well, 1.2 moles divided by one is also going to be the molarity value. So I have originally um, 1.2 concentration in 1.2 and zero HF. What will the concentration, okay, of uh, HF be when equilibrium is achieved and there's no dilution? So what I know is that stoichiometrically speaking, I should lose one molar of X amount and one molar of X amount for each reactant. And I should gain two molar of X amount change for my products. So then what happens is my, okay, uh, my values become for equilibrium 1.2 minus X, 1.2 minus X and, okay, 2X. Well, that's an algebraic expression of my KEQ, which I know is going to be equal to 2.5. My KEQ is equal to 2.50, I'm told that. And that's going to equal HF concentration squared all over H2 times F2, which right now I have an algebraic summary of that. 2X squared all over 1.2 min uh, minus X times 1.2 minus X. So that's basically 1.2 minus X squared. Because I'm using my stoichiometric change. I just know that the changes have to be stoichiometrically aligned. Okay. So then what I do is I solve for X. Okay. So I say that um, that's a really terrible thing to do a quadratic multiply out. So what I'm just going to do is I'm actually just going to square root everything to remove all the squaring. Because basically 1.2 minus X, yeah. right, is squared. So by removing the squaring, okay, I then get this value that the square root of, uh, which is about, by the way, 1.896 is equal to 2x all over 1.2 minus x. And I solve for x and it gives me x is approximately 0 0.5, okay, when rounded to sig figs uh, value. So then I say to myself, well, then what is the uh, the equilibrium concentrations? Well, I plug everything back in. And I specifically was asked, what will the concentration of HF be? That's what I actually want. So this is what I'm going to solve for. So HF at equilibrium, EQ, is equal to 2X, which is equal to 2 times 0.5 which is gonna be equal to one molar, okay? And that's how you would solve that problem. Now, I don't have time to have you guys do this on your own. You're gonna warm up with Charlie on the sample problem tomorrow. Charlie, do you hear that? Yeah, but I don't know what you're talking about. 
Uh, page 12. And I'll mark it on my um, iPad. You're going to warm up with this problem. And then, and then you're going to do one, and then a second warm up with the second type of a third last problem I'm going to introduce to them. All right. So that's how you would do this second type of ice table problem. Your final type, this is like the first time I've looked up in like five minutes. Your final type of ice table problem is your dream problem. It is the simplest out of all of them. Okay. And it involves poor hand. Okay. It involves determining the initial concentration from K and equilibrium given uh, concentrations. So what we have here, and don't forget, I have been, I do have a general flow of how to solve the problems on the side. What we have here is how are we going to predict what we call the initial concentrations or the concentrations before a change, before equilibrium was established. So what we have is a, a gas-based reaction again, and I'm going to translate down so I can fit it into my size um, ice table that I always overwrite. It's very cute little hiccups. Okay, so uh, we are given that we have, when equilibrium was established, CO was 0 0.5, and we have the KEQ. And you're like, that's not enough. Yes, it is, because you know that if you have 0 0.15 and you like definitely didn't have any product in the beginning, right? you know that your stoichiometric change had to be for H2 positive 0 0.3, twice that of carbon monoxide. And your uh, consumption of CH3OH has to be the same molarity change. So 0 0.15, but this time a loss because you're consuming it to make product. So then you say it's X is on top. We're trying to solve for what X is, the initial concentration. So you'd say your equilibrium values are 0 0.3 and 0 0.15 given and X minus 0 0.15. And then all you do is plug into KEQ and uh, you know that KEQ is gonna be the concentration of CO times the concentration of H2 squared all over the concentration of your initial CH3OH. And you're told that this is equal to 0 0.04. So you already know that this reaction favors the reactant side, the reverse, because it's a less than one. And it's going to be 0 0.15. I'm going to plug in the values that I know times 0 0.3 squared all over X. And you just solve for X. And sorry, did I say X? I'm at X minus 0 0.15 to be accurate to the equilibrium concentration value. And then when you solve for X, what you get is that X, which is going to be equal to the concentration of CH3OH is 0 0.49. And that's your dream KEQ problem. The third one's the simplest. And you will do this warm up tomorrow with Charlie. Four nine, yes, molarity. All of these are molarity values unless you're doing it in partial charge or sorry, partial pressure ATM. All right, guys, really good work. Tomorrow you're warm up with the two problems. You have a few minutes left in class. Try them out now while you just have people around you.